our speaker, which is going to be Carl Duper. He's going to tell you a little bit about his life personally and his professional life. At 28, he was the CEO at Advent Health Hospital in Colorado. Also at 28, or at 30, he started a laundry and cleaning business. And at 32, hit Tidy Task got franchised. So we're excited to hear him speak, and please welcome Carl Duper. Well, thanks so much for having me. You guys, like, this is a group that cleans up pretty good. You guys, like, actually went to your dorm rooms before this and buttoned it all up and everything. I should have should have gone the full suit, I guess, but this is a good looking group. Thanks so much for spending an hour with me. Um, it's one of those wild experiences to come back to campus and then realize, oh, the reason they invited me back, this is, it's been 10 years and um, feels a lot longer, feels like a lot more has happened in 10 years than you can even think back on. Um, but man, this is like such a cathartic experience, putting this together for you and getting to kind of zoom back and zoom out of the last 10 years and say, wait a minute, it's been like a whirlwind since leaving. What's all happened? And then more so than what's all happened, like why would it matter to someone that's in college right now? And so that's what I'm gonna try and focus on because this talk is about you and the stage of life that you're in right now and how you can unfold the next 10 years of your life in the exact way that you want to. Um, and so we're gonna talk a lot and you're gonna see a lot in this presentation, three words, intentionality, consistency, positivity. So we'll, we'll spend the time defining them since we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about them. Intentionality, act of living with deliberate purpose and direction, making choices that align with your vision. It's simply the act of, in a consistent state, choosing who you wanna be and then going and being that. Um, you'll be shocked as you get out into your professional career how easy it is just to kind of like show up do the minimum required and then kind of meander through life but you'll start to notice people around you that just seem to be promoting quicker or doing more at work and when you ask them about their personal life typically you're going to hear some things that they're doing that you may not be and it's like having a monthly approach to how did i meet the habits that I want to become last month and how am I doing better this next month and after college guys like no one's doing it for you right it's it's up to you and um, so intentionality important word in each of the life chapters that uh, that I show you um, we're going to show what were some of my intentions in that life chapter that that created um, the the success within that chapter Next one, consistency. Personally, by far, this is my hardest one to, to stay at it. Consistency is when you run out of motivation, choosing to do the tough or boring or challenging thing um, just because you have the discipline to do it. And then last, positivity. My opinion, the most underrated skill someone ha can have is being able to look at a tough situation and choose to be happy about it. Um, once you recognize that in your life, being happy, being positive, and how you approach your family, your work life, and, and everything is a decision. It's not an outcome of your circumstances, but it is um, you know, something you choose. You guys all know the song, right? Anyone care to sing it for the class right now? So we can, no singers in here? I'm not either, so we'll move on. These three words are gonna account for some of um, the most important mo moments of your life moving forward, or they might not. If, if um, you know, you can be like the majority of society and, and kind of just cruise through life, but if you wanna really be intentional about your career, be intentional about the family life you wanna build, the professional life you wanna build, um, these words will be important. 
So who am I and why am I standing in front of you? Certainly no one special, um, but just a guy that happened to go to school here 10 years ago and that's why I'm here. But just to give you like the high level overview of what the last 10 years have looked like, I graduated from Union. From Union, I went and did residency in Florida, which you guys are probably all familiar with that as an option and going to Advent Health and doing that gig. So I did that gig. I got my MBA during those three years. Then I went and was the director of operations for 18 urgent cares in Kansas, Tampa, and North Carolina. From there, I was the CEO of Advent Health Winter Garden in Florida. And then after that, I felt like that all laid the groundwork and foundation for me, me to be able to start my own business. So that's what I've been doing for the last three years. But let's zoom into each of those chapters now and see how intentions and consistent actions led to results in each of those. So at Union, like maybe some of you, my intentions weren't all that intentional. I wanted to have fun with friends. A couple of those friends are here today and we did have a lot of fun. Um, maybe like some of you, a major goal of coming to Union College was to find a spouse. Um, I kind of sweated that out and then senior year got really serious about it. And um, I don't know where you guys are in that equation for yourself, but critical and, and one of the most fun decisions that you can make that will have a lot to do with the rest of your life story. Um, and then like some of you seniors feeling the heat right now, at the end of this, I was looking at the amount of money I would spend getting an education. I said, I sure want to find something that helps me make that back, right? And earn, earn some cash. Um, so consistently while I was here, like I try to do the things that would put me in spaces to have fun with my friends. I did a lot of the ASB events. I joined athletics whenever I could. Went out on a lot of dates and a lot of banquets as some of you, and that was my consistent effort to find a spouse. And um, then senior year, my, I, I did a year of uh, student missions, which meant then I was a year behind all my friends that graduated. So then senior year, I ended up running for ASB president, did a lot of that. The two stories or two moments that stand out the most to me as important from my time at Union is number one, student missions. If you have the opportunity to do a year abroad, my advice would be do it. For me, it was where I actually grew up for the first time. Um, the story that made that happen was me going to an outer island of Pompeii, Micronesia with a hundred high school kids, being responsible that none of them is gonna walk away drowned after that weekend or in some weird baby mama situation or, and I was, you know, a 20 year old with this responsibility of, of being responsible for high school kids. That's just not an experience that you're gonna get um, unless you do something like student missions. The second is that ASB present experience. I was, um, Lisa could probably attest, I was a student that was not that interested in being a part of student government or doing ASB, but it was literally a situation where my friends graduated. I was looking at a year where the first half of it, my girlfriend was doing student teaching. So I was like, what am I gonna do? And thankfully, Linda Becker came to me and said, I think you should run for president. Thank goodness I ran unopposed because that's probably the only reason <laughs> that it happened. Um, but it was the first way that I got to kick the tires on leading a team. And then it was my first experience listening to consumers and trying to actually create in the real world something that they found valuable. And we had a lot of fun. And I think we had a, a good year that year. So let's, let's keep moving. Um, but that was my time at Union. Um, Should have gone to this slide like two minutes ago as I was talking through all this stuff, but this is some of the results. This is in Pompeii, uh, being out on the outer islands. We would snorkel and surf most weekends. Pompeii is like half vacation, half student missions. So if you're on the fence about student missions, Pompeii is like a good middle ground of where you can have fun and make a big difference. Um, 
This is Molly, my spouse. She's got two kids with her this morning, so she'll probably roll in in a couple minutes and there will be a louder amount of noise in here. So, um, and then found a job. We were, Molly and I were long distance for like the first two years. Um, you guys that have girlfriends or boyfriends are, and our seniors are about to learn about something called I, that I call the life merge. Um, on April Fool's Day, senior year, I got the job offer to be a resident with Advent Health. Molly, that same day, got an offer to be a teacher in Tennessee. We told each other, hey, like, those job offers we've been waiting for, like, they're here. Neither of us believed each other because it was April Fool's Day. So we said, let's, let's just, like, link up tomorrow and make sure that this is all on the up and up and we're actually doing this. Um, sure enough, we, we were going separate ways. And then for the next few years, we spent that time figuring out how we're we gonna bring it all back together and start our family life. And so, um, thankfully, that happened um, when I went to, to Advent Health. But the first two years of residency, I was there um, without Molly, and, but with a lot of my life friends. Um, man, the residency, I cannot say enough positive things about it, guys. If it's an opportunity for you, it is worth competing for. Um, not a lot of jobs out there that are gonna pay for your MBA and pay you to learn for three additional years. I mean, that, that really was my experience. Um, so I recognized what an opportunity it was, and when I arrived there, um, my intentions that I set were, I'm gonna learn as much as a resident can learn in the next three years that I'm here. I'm gonna create my first professional network by being genuinely interested and curious with every individual that I talk to. And after residency, I'm gonna find my first real job. Just, just an FYI guys, residency isn't a real job. That's okay. It's actually better to not treat it like a real job. There's a whole lot of residents that take themselves a little bit too seriously rather than realizing I am here to learn. I'm here to be curious and ask questions. I'm not here to prove that I'm smart or prove that one day I might be a leader. That's why they hired you guys. Like they know that that potential is there, but your whole goal is to learn more. And the only way that you learn more is by being curious. To be curious, you have to be a little vulnerable, which means not pretending you're smart, but actually saying, I'm probably the dumbest person in this room, and that's why I'm gonna be asking questions at the end of this. Um, consistent actions, the thing I did most during those three years, write down acronyms. Um, if you've, any of you've interned in healthcare so far, you know it's a new language. You know that there's so much that happens in any given meeting that you walk away saying, wow, I like comprehended maybe like 10% of that. That was me for like the whole first year of residency, but praise the Lord that my first mentor in residency, the first day I met with her, sat me down and said, Carl, you know nothing. That's okay. Every Friday, you're gonna come to my office with your notebook full of all the things you don't know, and just for an hour, we're gonna go through all of those things, and I will do the ABC's version of teaching you what healthcare is. Um, one of the greatest gifts anyone's ever given me, that's Danielle Johnson. And um, I ask a lot of questions to everyone smarter than me, which was everyone I ended up working with. Um, being gen you, you, the, if you're here for the presentation before me, you heard the guy mention how to win friends and influence people. Amazing book, definitely read it. It's critically important. One of the things that you'll learn from that book is getting someone talking about what they are interested in and what they are doing well is actually the quickest way to make a friend. Oh, and by the way, when you get someone talking about what they're passionate about, you're gonna learn a ton. I'm gonna say it again because it happens so often, but the most common mistake that new residents make when they go and start residency is they aren't vulnerable, they think they need to prove themselves, 
So therefore they go into spaces pretending, no, no, I, I belong here. I know what I, you know, I know what's going on and I'm not going to ask questions because I, yeah, I got this stuff down. And um, if you just take, like, if you just take an honest approach to residency and at an appropriate, like you don't interrupt the meeting, right? And you don't stop the course of business to say what's going on, but you find the individual in the room that you say, they're saying something interesting. I don't know what they're talking about, but it's probably something I need to know. Find a time or ask them for 15 minutes or if you can buy them coffee later that day and chat about what was going on there. Those are the things that are gonna accelerate your learning experience. Um, and guarantee that you have a really good residency. So um, the results were, were really positive during uh, my resi but residency, but they weren't all positive. Um, this left-hand picture is a picture after I got rejected from my first post-residency job interview after I showed up over an hour late to the interview with the CEO of Florida Hospital East after my dream car broke down in the middle lane of I-4 and I still think to this day he doesn't believe that, that that's what happened. I think he thought I just was running late. So things don't always just unfold very easily but um, thankfully I did land at Advent Health Center Care as my first real job um, after getting in my MBA, after building a, a professional network. Um, and frankly, this is one of the best stops of my career at uh, Advent Health Center Care. Um, the intentions that I set when I, uh, you know, Molly and I, now Molly and I were married, we were setting our family up in Florida. Um, and if everyone just could take a second right now, turn around and just wave to Molly. <laughs> So she's hanging out with us today. Um, but my intentions were to prove it professionally. So residency was three additional years of learning, but now it was time for me to show I have used that time wisely and I can bring value back to the organization that taught me so much. Um, deep in the professional knowledge and relationships that I built. And then this is where I, increased my intentionality at home as a husband where Molly and I every Sunday were checking in on how did we do last week what is our family doing this week Sunday since we didn't have kids at the time ended up being one of our biggest work days she was the pastor of a 1400 member church in Florida around this same time so you could imagine how busy things kind of got at home but for us since our spousal relationship has always come first. It meant we've always been synced up enough to say, in this stage, it was, are you good? I'm good. Like, professionally, that's where we're focusing all our time, energy, and effort right now. Are we good to continue to grow that way? And since we continued to check in on that weekly basis, it meant we, we could stay good um, from, uh, from a family angle, but continue to really excel professionally. Consistent actions. Um, as I'm going through, please write your questions down and I'm gonna ask someone to ask the question about prioritize and execute. It's a chapter of a book. Um, I'll leave it at that. We can talk about it if you guys are interested in it during our question and answer time. Um, but it's something that I did daily at minimum weekly in my professional life. Uh, team sync up, it's something, uh, you know, 18 urgent cares, there's a lot going on in different spaces. So creating clarity was the number one role that I had. Um, it was less about what could Carl do and more about what is the clarity that Carl could create for everyone else so that they could really do well in their jobs. That's another book that taught me how to do that called The Advantage by Patrick Lencioni, an amazing one. And um, this, on a family note, this is also um, where Molly and I, we got married on the 26th of June. So we started every 26th 
um, doing what we call the 26th date. We still do that today. The 26th date that, that I do with my spouse covers the most likely topics that lead to divorce. So we, in our premarital counseling, identified, hey, like, what's likely to lead you down the path of divorce? And then we just connect on each of those topics every month. Great way to guarantee like you're not gonna walk that path or have divergent paths if you're just connecting on it consistently. So those topics are finance, spiritual, sex. I knew I'd get a few more eyes looking and like this is a good time to get eyes on the presentation by, by mentioning that. Um, professional, physical, like are we working out? Are we staying fit? Are we meeting those goals? And now we've added kids to that monthly rotation of conversations. And so, um, man, we did a lot in a couple years at Centric Care. Um, in the 18 urgent cares I was responsible, we increased profitability by over a million bucks, which was pretty cool, but what it meant was also more jobs, people feeling less stressed and having more clarity within the centers and what they're doing. Um, some of the projects that were really fun during this time, physician scheduling was like all of our physicians' worst nightmare. They hated how last minute requests always were. And it, long story short, we made life easier for our physicians and our managers. Care navigation, and we did a consumer pricing thing, which was kind of a pet project for me, um, but, but made things clear and easier for our uh, consumers. So it was a great time. We did a lot of fun uh, things professionally, which led to an unexpected phone call um, Thanksgiving of 2019, where um, my future boss reached out and said, hey, like we've got a unique opportunity for you. Um, Advent Health Winter Garden is a freestanding ED with a surgical center. We're, we're needing to build inpatient beds there, um, but really we need someone that can lead the connection to the community in Winter Garden. Um, and they thought that I was the right person for that job. Um, so at 28 years old, I jumped into the uh, CEO of a hospital, hospital role um, and started pounding the pavement in Winter Garden and connecting with the local physicians, the local leaders. And um, ba basically the story in Winter Garden is for 30 plus years, this was an area that our competition had a long standing relationship and they did a great job of painting us as kind of the evil ones. Um, and so our job was just to kind of flip that script and, and say, hey, like, no, we're literally here to help the community. Here's how we're going to do it. And here's how you're going to be a part of it. Um, so, um, that went well. We started construction on a $230 million hospital expansion. Um, big job for a young kid, but again, it's not me doing it. Like as you get into leadership, you're gonna realize it is not about you. It's about what you're able to do with others' strengths and weaknesses. And thankfully at the Advent Health System, there is an amazing team of people leading and guiding that construction effort. Um, that I got to play a small role in. Um, this is also when Molly and I decided it was the right time to start our family. Um, and in the middle of it, we all got a, a beautiful present called COVID-19. You can imagine what being the leader of a hospital in the middle of one of the largest public health crises looks like. Um, definitely added a lot of stress and hours and challenges to my plate professionally and personally. Um, but here's, here's some pictures of those results. So this is hospital groundbreaking that Mal got to come with me to. Um, this is some of the community connection stuff. This is not what it mostly looks like. Wow, this is touch screen, cool. Let's see here. Um, in any case, it really looks like you being in the back office of physician practices, connecting with doctors, and, um, but that's what it looks like when it's pretty. Um, this is COVID-19, and this photo is the first pictures of Wesley in front of the hospital that we were building. 
out there in Winter Garden. And so, um, man, Advent Health, what an awesome chapter. And it was certainly the chapter out of college that laid a concrete foundation and structure for my understanding of business, leadership, how to work with other people, how to lead results. Um, and I just, I can't say enough good things about that route. And the thing I want to mention to this group is out of college, like you need an experience, in my opinion, where you gain context for the first time. Business is a game. Like after you play it long enough, you get to look into it and say, oh, like it's a game just like basketball. There's out of bounds, there's rules. And is there any athletes in here? Anyone that plays basketball? Can you tell me about the first basketball game you ever played? What did that look like? Like, I'm talking like preschool. Okay, what did the first one look like? Do you guys have like a structured defense or did you run plays like? So, so I know when I played my first game like in, in grade school, like I just knew this round thing needed to go in that circular thing in the sky, right? And that was my strategy. And when I look back at graduation day at Union, like that's where I was at from a business strategy perspective. It was like, oh, I know what the word revenue means. I know what expenses are. I know what profit is. But you haven't really gotten reps in, oh, when you do this or you push this button, this is how it affects the rest of the game. And so what I'm trying to say here, make the case for, is learn the rules of the game somewhere where culturally and structurally um, there's not a lot of distraction that's going to like prevent you from actually learning that. In my case, Advent Health was an amazing space that you can not have a lot of noise or distraction about what is going on and you can focus on the fundamentals of, of business and learn, you know, if you are to go on and do your own thing someday, oh, this is how I play the game of business well. So, for me, um, this is a, a personal life switch that was leading the decision making. In, um, at the end of 2020, December 2020, my son Wesley was born. And uh, it was also coinciding with a restructure that was happening at Advent Health and we were moving leadership seats. Basically, that gave me the opportunity to look at our projected future lives and chat with Molly about what do we want our life story to be. Um, we talked about other positions or, or continuing on the healthcare ladder. And then we talked about what starting your own business or um, for me moving back to Colorado, which is where I grew up, where all my family still is. Um, we just talked about what those potential lives looked like from a personal side and decided we're not going to get an opportunity like this again to, to start something and focus it around building freedom of time for our family as the primary goal for the rest of our lives. Um, so intentions during this time, again, really personal life led. Be the dad and husband I've always wanted to be design a business model that um, creates consistent income, low financial risk, and freedom of time, and a business that scales through systems and processes, not Carl does more, like you guys have all heard the entrepreneurial grind, you've read the books or you've heard the podcast, and that's not how I'm building my business, it's through systems, processes, things that can be trained, delegated, and. That's why um, cleaning and laundry, pretty simple business, right? Like you all know how to clean, you all know what laundry is. When, for me, it was an attractive business because it was so simple, you can do it a lot better. Um, 
and, and hardwire those things into the core of the business so that it can scale nationally, again, without Carl being the one that needs to go to every place and open every new branch. Um, and, and that's really what, what franchising is. Um, we can go into that business model, how it works, what franchising is. Um, if you guys are interested in that, ask those questions. But results-wise, um, these have been like the three most fulfilling years of my life, personally and professionally. Um, what you see here is the birth of my son, which really kicked off this whole transition. Um, this is what building Tidy Tass has, was mostly looking like the first year with Wes strapped to my chest. Um, another very, very beautiful thing about starting your own business, you get to choose what your office is. So my office is Topgolf. Um, I looked at all the, the commercial options in Denver and it was like thousand bucks a month for like a shared desk you can't even take a private call at. And then I, Realize Top Golf has a hundred dollar a month membership, and you can do a hundred swings before every before and after every checklist thing you finish. That's a, a setup that I got used to pretty quick. Um, we moved to Colorado, traded our boardroom at Advent Health for a whiteboard in my living room. That's still where Molly and I do a lot of our planning together. Um, that's Wes Tidy Tass's first mascot. Um, we got season tickets to our favorite team, the Nuggets, and thankfully they've been doing pretty good lately. Any Nuggets fans in here? All right, there we go. Um, we got our first franchisee in Daytona, Florida. Um, he's now 16 months in. He hit his total startup cost ROI on his branch already and is growing his business really well. That it for me is like the most rewarding thing, seeing someone else be able to take the business model that I built and with relatively low effort say, we deployed it in a new market and it worked. So that, that's what Michael did for us. And we're just family photos. This is, we're just gonna roll through these because this is what I'm all about. So this is Wesley learning to bike. This is our family going to the NBA finals last year. Um, Another beautiful thing about doing your own business, you can kind of link it up with the things that you love and are passionate about. So we did a cool promotion where if the Nuggets won the championship, one of our customers would get all of their maid service refunded for the whole year. So that's Bridget getting her giant check for all of her cleans that year. This is us finding out that Alice is going to be number two. We're going to have a boy and a girl. and. Um, that's her down there and now she's strapped on molly's front right there looking cute as ever with her little black bow then obviously we take this year the obligatory family photos went to a super bowl with one of my best friends that's in front row here and uh the thing that i've enjoyed the most this year teaching wesley how to snowboard I know we're in like a business environment now and like the whole thing I'm supposed to do is like, no, like grind it out and here's how you pers like professionally do this, this and this and your career will excel. My opinion is you bring your whole self everywhere you go. And for me, a lot of who I am revolves around the family that I wanted and the family that I wanted to create on this earth. And the, experiences that I wanted my kids to have. And um, I'm so glad that I took the steps over the last three years that I have because frankly, these memories as they show here would not exist in the same format if I hadn't started my own business. And that was a decision that Molly and I made as she was the pastor of a 1400 member church as the CEO of a hospital. We were one month away from Wesley being born and um, we said, this equation doesn't balance. There's not enough time to be the parents that we wanna be and be the leaders that we wanna be. And um, so this, I'm hoping this presentation could show you like, it's up to you guys. Like your life story is your life story um, and, and you make it what you want it to be. So if you fell asleep while I was showing family photos, 
um, and you're just like, okay, what's the whole point of this thing? Like, I'm ready to start my career and I want advice on that. Um, the first piece of advice, you decide what your life story is. I think a lot of us walk in and out of college with a lot of voices telling us what our, our path forward should be. So I'm here to tell you like, your life story is yours. It's not your parents. It's not your professors. It's not even your mentors. It's not your friends. You get to choose the story you want to write. So write it. Creating your dream life story takes courage and confidence. Those are required skills, in my opinion, to be able to, to choose what your story is going to be. The beautiful thing about those two, they're learned skills. So if you don't feel like you're a confident person today, develop it, practice it, um, and, and you can get there. And then intentionality, consistency, positivity can all be used to make the most out of whatever life chapter you're in. And when you apply those three words in every li life chapter over a lifetime, inevitably you will end up living your dream life story. That's just the results of your consistent actions. If you see nothing else over the last 10 years, that's what I hope you see is like, at the beginning of each of these life chapters, Molly and I connected and said, what do we want out of this stage of our lives? We optimize our entire life around those goals and intentions that we made. And every single time we reached those goals and then life changed and life is going to change. And we decided to let having kids significantly change what we oriented, what's most important around. We, and um, in any case, I think um, those three words can make a big difference in your life. I haven't said a whole lot about God, which is like a huge core part. My relationship with God is like a really personal thing to me. So I am not the person that goes out and like sprays it everywhere. Thankfully, I married a pastor. So like she can do all of it for the both of us. And like that equation balances. And if you guys are going to be here tomorrow, she's preaching at the 11 o'clock. So definitely show up and give her some love. Um, but the thing I do want to say, because I've watched this play out in my life, in my friends' lives, if you insulate, you can insulate yourself from any challenge that you run into in life by basing your identity solely on the fact that you are a child of God. If you know that the creator of this universe loves you, regardless of what you do professionally, regardless of what you're struggling with, regardless of the, the challenges and the hurdles that you're going to end up running into, you're going to be able to get through some pretty tough stuff by basing it there. And it means you're never going to stay too long in a life chapter that it's time to close. Many people redefine what their identity is based on the current life chapter they're in. And sometimes they stay there 20, 30 years and you meet them in year 20 or 30 and they're pretty depressed because they didn't keep growing or, or changing with what was happening in their life. So if you say to that, Great, like thanks for the theology and the philosophical lesson, but I have classes tomorrow and I'm interviewing this next week and I actually want to do some, you know, I need some practical takeaways, Carl. Like I can't take your philosophy lesson and change how I'm doing something tomorrow. I set up like this little automated text. Thankfully, Tidy, Tidy Task has an automated text system that I can kind of pirate for this use. Um, so I just put together like a text message response. If you text this, it's going to send you back, in my opinion, like the most influential books and podcasts that I've read or listened to in the last 10 years. Um, this includes the book with Prioritize and Execute. It includes um, like one of the most influential books in my life, The Energy Bus. Um, which is all about positivity and how you can use positivity to your advantage. And um, in any case, 
This will be one of those classes where I encourage you to pull out your phones. You're welcome to text this. I feel my pocket buzzing, so that's cool. Um, but take that, use it. You just Google these things, get them on Amazon. But um, that's my story. And that's the last 10 years. I hope the next 10 years I am able to come back 10 years from now and have even more to tell you about how it's unfolded. But um, right now, I'm, I'm really interested in hearing what you're interested to learn about. I'm sorry, can you turn that phone number back on? Yes, there we go. Thank we'll you. leave it here for another couple minutes, and then I'll switch back. Yeah. I'll also entertain any Nuggets-related questions. <laughs> I did, yeah. You know, last year we lost seven of our last ten games in route to our finals win. So that's the blanket that, of comfort that I'm sleeping underneath right now. All right? What's up? Which finals game did you go to? So I went to game one and then the clinching game. The yeah, yeah, it was fun. What's up? <laughs> All right. Hear ya. I don't, personally. So there are things that I do miss. Um, the thing that I miss the most being an entrepreneur is the team. Like being an entrepreneur is lonely. So I'm just gonna throw that out there as like it's a lonely path because you are the only leader. In the CEO role, like there are a lot of lonely moments because again, being the leader of any organization so for me it was of a small hospital like there's things that you have to hold within yourself that aren't necessarily things you can bring to the whole team so it's a little isolating but in those environments you have other mentors and individuals in that same situation that you can connect with and um, that's one of the things that I certainly miss most about being a part of an organization like that I just have a quick question. So uh, when you talked about Advent Health and starting your new um, business, you really talked about how um, being a leader is putting others in a place to be successful. Oh, yeah. Just like using their talents to help benefit like your business or to make it grow. What is the like key tools to identifying that in other people? Identifying skills? Yeah. Um, so the one Advent Health used, so the one that I'm most familiar with, DISC, is like a great personality assessment, right? So I, I'm going to use the sports analogy just because it's the thing I'm most familiar with, if that's OK with this group. So like as a coach, you have one job, right? Like uh, we'll use basketball again as, as the example. Like this individual is tall and big. They probably can rebound and make layups, right? This individual is short and fast. They can dribble. Maybe they can be a, a person that creates space, creates plays, and, and you know is a point guard that facilitates the rest of the team. Business is a game, and you can look at it in the same dynamics in terms of every individual in this room has a different set of strengths and weaknesses. Simplified down to like its finest parts, Leadership is maximizing your team's strengths and minimizing or eliminating their weaknesses. If you're able to do that, you are going to su see success wherever you go, and it's going to be 0% about you and 100% about what you were able to bring out in the people that were around you. Give us a plug for Tidy Tasks. Plug for Tidy Task? Yeah, okay, Tidy Task is cleaning laundry done. If you want to delegate eight hours of chores with a text message or a click in an app, then use Tidy Task. Um, we help professional families delegate chores that they shouldn't be doing um, to professionals that frankly do it better than them. And we're trusted and um, man, you're gonna love, love your house and love your relationship post laundry and dishes that i was a customer that was my entry into this space when i was ceo 
um, man, my parents in their infinite wisdom, I was complaining to them about like how busy I was and man, the only time I see Molly, it's like over the sink doing dishes or folding our laundry while we're watching a show. My parents are like, why are you doing this stuff? Like you gotta find help. I tried to find help when I was in Florida and I encountered like a three week process of people like wanting to come to my house to tell me how much it would cost to clean it instead of just estimating based on size. Like basically to be an entrepreneur, you don't have to do, like you don't need a, the billion dollar idea that all of you hear about. You just need to find a legitimate problem that isn't being solved the right way and even if someone else is solving it in another pocket elsewhere, like again, th this is not a new idea that I'm building, but it is in crazy demand. And it's why we've been able to grow very rapidly because cleaning is something that is gonna be a need until the end of time. Um, and now this is turning from a 30 second commercial to like a full diatribe. So that's where I'm gonna stop. Yeah, my personal goal with Tidy Tasks is to grow to a national brand that, again, we're talking 10 years from today, and you're like, oh, I think I've probably heard, like I live in Timbuktu, and I think I heard about that before. Um, personally, there, there's a, a, an interesting side to franchising a business. Um, if you're interested in entrepreneurship, I'd encourage you to connect with me on LinkedIn. I try to do a post every week like just encouraging other entrepreneurs. It's that space because I found myself like lonely and wanting to create a space. I'm like, I'm gonna try and do that on LinkedIn and find other people that are going through the entrepreneurial journey. Um, but one thing I posted about on there is essentially the financial trade-off of pursuing a life of employment versus a life of ownership. Um, for me, the de a big part of the financial decision to switch from even a large role as CEO with a, a pretty decent salary to one of ownership had a lot less to do with the monthly income that I could get from owning my own business and had a lot more to do with the equity that I could build in a saleable asset. So moving from a local cleaning and laundry business, which would typically sell for maybe three times profit, it's a pretty small number. If you build a franchise business on systems and processes that are trainable and delegatable, you can get a 10 to 15 times multiple when you sell that business. And that's real money that we're talking about at that point. So, Selfishly, like there's a financial element to growing any business. That's the scoreboard of business. Just FYI, like money is the points on the board when you're in business. Um, and I would say that's my goal. National growth and eventual sale. Um, how do you approach like work family life balance? Because you mentioned like yeah, having your son on your chest while you're working. Yeah. Do you overlap a lot or do you try and separate those two into two? I bring it with me everywhere. So that was, that was a big like crux of the decision for me. Like I watched a few of my mentors go through some pretty rough stuff in the C-suites I was a part of by compartmentalizing. When you are at the tippy top of leadership, sometimes compartmentalization is required. Like you have to separate yourself and be in that professional space and you can't bring family there because there's just so much to do. And um, that was a big, in, in my experience, reason for the switch was I wanted to live a life where literally my office in my basement is right, and right out here is like the playroom. So I finish a meeting, I'm hopping outside and I'm playing catch with Wesley for five or 10 minutes before I jump into my next thing. That's the life story that I want to write. I want to be the dad that's like totally there and totally present. Um, and so the answer to your question is like, that was a big crux of the decision. It's also a big part of like the pace of growth 
with tidy tasks. Tidy tasks could be further down the road than we are today, three years in. Like we, we've done pretty well for ourselves, but I've grown it on probably 20 to 30 hours a week. Like you're not talking to the entrepreneur that's telling you, guys, 100 hours a week or else you're not making it. 100 hours a week or else you're, you know, you're not gonna be able to blitz scale. And that is, that's a storyline and a journey I'm not really interested in, in being a part of. And um, I hope like what you see in this life story is you can choose that. But it is a choice. Like I made a sacrifice, right? I could have stayed on this the latter journey as well, and it would have had trade-offs. And it doesn't mean if I stayed there, I would have been a bad dad. It just would have been a different dynamic, and it wasn't the life story that I wanted to write for myself. What else? Yeah. What was the hardest part of starting your own company? Man, the hardest part. Going from zero to one. So Ted Glazer is sitting over there. He started Summit Lawns. He talked at this last year, and um, Ted started his lance, like his uh, lawn lawn care business while we were in college. So when I was sitting in this room taking notes and in b business law, Teddy sat like in the row in front of me, and he was run he was doing invoices. And he's getting in trouble from the B-Law professor for not paying attention because he's sending invoices out to his client. When I decided entrepreneurship was like a path for me, I made a call to Teddy really early. And one of those really important conversations we had was, Carl, sounds like you got a lot of great ideas. Maybe you should just start. And just starting is the hardest, that's where most people filter out. They've got an idea or they've got a thing, but then they come up with a million reasons of, oh, well, it's not gonna work if I don't. To be an entrepreneur and to actually be successful at it, all you have to know how to do is build the stair right in front of you. Then step on it and then build the next stair. That is all I've been doing for the last three years. But I think a lot of people stop and say, oh wait, like the, the vision or the business I wanna grow is like up here and I don't know what the staircase is to get there and then they just step away. Um, so, long answer to a short question. Is that helpful? Cool. Any other, yeah. You, you wanna talk about the evolution, how you test it, it always started with just cleaning, was there food prep, some of the other things, uh, ideas that you had to begin with? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question because it has like morphed and changed over time. Um, when I first started Tidy Tasks, my kind of total vision was like delegate all home chores. And um, it, was, it was the, um, all the things that I had delegated as a CEO was cleaning, laundry, meal prep. Um, one of the quickest learnings, like six months into Tidy Tasks, was like, no one wants to buy food from a cleaning company. Shouldn't be a shocker, but it took me like going through, oh, the brand Tidy Task is not this, so I cut it. And then we've been growing really a cleaning business that upsells laundry and um, there's a lot to be said about like narrowing your focus. If you try and do everything, consumers are gonna say, ah, maybe you don't really do anything well. I'm gonna find the company that does, does the one thing that I want done perfect. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Or maybe we should start headed down to the amphitheater. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, right here, and then let's do here, and then here. How does it uh, feel knowing that the wolves follow the nuggets? Mm. Uh, <laughs> right here. Uh, on every single one of your slides, uh, through every phase of life, you explicitly talked about prioritize and execute. And you said someone come back and ask you about that. Yeah, OK. Prioritize and execute. We're going to do 30 seconds on prioritize and execute. So um, there's a book, Extreme Ownership, by Jocko Willick. 
You can read the whole book if you're like me, zoom straight to the prioritize and execute chapter. That is how you build each step right in front of you. So if you texted that number, you also got a link to the project tracker that I use. That thing is not that fancy. It's incredibly simple. But what it does is it forces me every time I go into work, I'm reprioritizing the projects that are going to move the business forward in the most tangible way. And then I'm going to the associated task list and completing those tasks. My life has been redesigned around my family, which means some days, my Tuesday is two and a half hours of work. The beautiful thing about that is since I can say, this is my two hours today, I go to my tracker and I prioritize and execute. And many times I find myself getting more done in a two hour slot than in a corporate environment I would get done in two or three days just because of the communication that's required, because of the other associated baggage that comes with um, needing to drive to a place to work. There's, there's just a lot there, but use the pro project tracker to prioritize and execute. If you wanna know how to prioritize and execute, buy extreme ownership and read the chapter, prioritize and execute. And we're gonna stop there. Thank you guys so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Cool. Appreciate it. Taking your time.